really don't know what it is for sure. It's, is it a gun? Is it a, uh, is it a school? Is it a plan? What is it? Actually, Hawkins is a brand new. Samuel and Jake Hawkins were, were brothers, and they officially got on the books in St. Louis in 1825 as the Hawkins Gun Company. And Jacob, Jacob was the older brother. Both, both brothers had experience in uh, Harper's Ferry, and their, their father was a good spent. They came over here in 1870, the Hawkins family did. Uh, grandfather and father were good Smiths. And Jacob and Samuel carried on. Uh, Samuel was a veteran of the War of 1812. He was actually in the Battle of, I think it's at Bradenburg, the last big battle that we lost before they burned the White House down. Well, Sam was there. So, um, and, and, and uh, finally, finally got to St. Louis in about 1822. Jacob received. So they started this business in 1825. Um, they were good repair. They, they, they were blacksmiths. They, they had tomahawks. They, uh, they, they did more repairs of the building. And, and finally, uh, after being established probably between 25 and 1830, they got into building guns. The Hawkins brothers never had a gun factory that produced all of their own parts. Uh, no guns were absolutely identical, although the style today is recognizable uh, with certain features of the gun. But they bought their locks somewhere else, they bought their barrels somewhere else. Sometimes they, they, they manufactured their own barrels and they manufactured them with a 1 in 48 twist with a deep groove and that's kind of what we're married to today as far as Hawking history goes. Hawking didn't build anything to shoot mini balls or anything else because round balls were the thing of of, of the time, and the bullets didn't come into uh, in the boat in, in high use until the Civil War. So we're basically talking about um, round ball, fast round ball guns. So as, as they progressed, they, they put out a high quality gun uh, that was capable of taking Western game across the Mississippi and started going out west. You ran into Grizzly Bear and Elk and a larger game than East Coast and Buffalo. Yes, they ran into a Buffalo or two, I'm sure. Um, and, and that was one of the features of the Hawken rifle was, was the fact that it was capable of being used on anything out west. Um, Jacob died in 1849, and, and almost everything I've read on that says he was, he was buried in a mass grave on the banks of the Mississippi River. But there's also a little blurb by Charles Hansen in his book, um, The Hawk and Rifle of the Place in History, which is an excellent read if you want to know the details and history of the nuts and bolts of the Hawk and Enterprise. Um, but Hansen has this one little blurb in there that, that is a, um, uh, what, what do I want to say? It, it's an accounting of Samuel Hawk and Payne for Jacob's. Um, suit, his involvement, and his burial in Presbyterian Cemetery in St. In Louis in 1849. So I, I found that kind of interesting because everything else I read said he was just buried in, 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 in a mass grave from, from the cholera epidemic. Yeah. So, so Samuel carried on with the, with the gun shop until 1858. Uh, but Samuel's big thing was he was really into the St. Louis Fire Department. He was more of a fireman than he was a gunsmith. But he had people working for him that, that continued his business. And um, let, me, let me back up a little bit. Let's say Hawken is a brand. Hawken is the same as Remington or Winchester or Marlin or any other guns of the time. But Hawken didn't register their script or their name or anything else. It was just found in gun shop. So it, it was never registered. It was never recognized. Uh, J.P. Gemmer took over the, the shop. And he, he was a Hawken gunsmith and there are some Gemmer guns here up in Sappington House. But Gemmer ran the shop until 1960. And although he had his own own name on it. 1860. 
sorry, not age and senility. Anyway. But I love the guy, so it's cool. Um, so so Yemmer, Yemmer, Yemmer ran this place, and, and he never discontinued the use of the Hockman name. So the Hockman was always there. When, when, when Yemmer shut up the shop in, in 1960, it lay dormant in St. Louis. And then in the late 1960s, early 1970s, Art Russell acquired the Gemmer estate. Art was already a collector of fine St. Louis type guns. Realizing that he had the capability of reopening the Hawken shop in St. Louis, he did so. Because Hawken was now just a generic term, it couldn't be trademarked. So the Hawken shop was trademarked, and it's still a trademark today. Uh, Art was, I, I'm going to say Art was the inspiration for Thompson Center, just out of the blue, on the name Hawken, on a gun. And that's kind of where it started coming to, to prominence, as people saw this Thompson Center Hawken. And uh, then every half-stop gun in the world was now Hawken. Um, also about that time, there's a guy named John Milius that screen wrote a, a movie called Jeremiah Johnson. And in the movie, Robert Redford, who is anti-gun, but that's okay, I love praising for this movie, uh, uses the pocket name four times in the movie. And that was in the early 1970s. And that really boosted, along with Thompson Center, um, uh, Robert Redford, Art Russell, and there was also a guy by the name of John Bear that started putting out books in, in the late 60s uh, called The Hawk and Rifle, uh, Mountain Man's Load, and what's the other one? What's the other one? Bear's other book besides Mountain Man's Load. Uh, uh, Hawk. Oh, Mountain Man's Choice. Man. Mountain Man's Choice, thank you. Yeah. So anyway, that, that combination really kind of catapulted Hawk and to prominence again. And um, Art ran the shop up until the late 1980s when my lovely wife, for whatever reason, contacted him and he said, young lady, I'm offering a haunted shop for sale. And she looked at me and she says, Greg, we're in it. And so we bought the shop from Art in 1990. And our vision was to continue the Hawken legacy through the classic Plains Rifle which is a half-shot, big bore in our case 54 caliber, uh, percussion block with very nice Hawken features in the stock and the trigger guard and the whole presentation of the gun. We haven't gone to CNC machining. We haven't gone very modern, although we do have lathes and mills, but they're still, none of them are, are uh, they're, they're all hand crank and dial and stuff that we have to do. The tooling that Art had made to produce his gun came off of an original that he will tell you about here shortly. And so we're still using tooling and molds that were created from original Hawken parts. We're never going to get very big. Hawken was never very big. All we want to do is, is continue to produce a Hawken product with a S. Hawken St. Louis name on it and uh, provide that to, to, to the public today. Uh, we, we, we're responsible for 100% except the barrels. I have the barrels made by Rice Barrel Company to our specs. But the lock group, the trigger group, the springs, everything we have made on our stuff in our, our house. So I'm not dependent on somebody else for, for this kind of stuff. So, uh, again, we're, we're trying to just continue. The, we are just trying to continue the legacy of, of the Hawken shop through what we're producing today. And uh, with that, I'm going to let you meet Mr. Art Russell, uh, quite, a, quite, quite a gentleman, quite a storyteller, and really responsible for the reincarnation of the uh, of and shop today. Art? Thank you, sir. Thank you all for being here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm trying to talk loud so that you can. Now, uh, what happened with Jeremiah Johnson with that movie? Uh, when he wrestled that gun out of this frozen man's arms, everybody in the world knew a Hawken rifle. And with that interest of, from that movie, 
uh, everybody started building a hawk and rifle, just like Thompson Center and Connecticut Valley Arms and the ones that you see that have little resemblance to anything that was original, but the name stuck. And I had just a little shop, and at that time the name of my shop was Antique Arms. And I was an appraiser. I've been a personal property appraiser for virtually all my life. And so I bought my first hawk and rifle from a dealer in St. Louis, an antique dealer who said, Art knew of my family, my, my parents were in the antique business. And he said, I've got a rifle that you ought to buy. And I said, well, let's take a look at it. So I went over to the shop, took a look at it, and here's this brand spanking new looking hawk and rifle. And, oh, it was love at first sight. I said, what do you want for that gun? He said, for you, thousand dollars long. Now, that was in 1970. I ate beans for a month. <laughs> it was a gorgeous beans. I mean, striped stock, gorgeous thing. And everybody at that time was coming out and trying to beat one another with a cheaper gun. And my little business wasn't, wasn't tuned to that. So you had a choice. You either went high or you went low. So we said, we'll go, we'll go high. Some of you may know the name Keith Neubauer. Well, Keith Neubauer was probably one of the finest gunsmiths on the face of the earth at that time. We were blessed to have him doing our work and making our molds and tooling, which he did from that first gun that I owned. So the Hawken rifle that is being reproduced by the Hawken shop now and the one that we produced from the first gun that I owned is the one that you see and the one that's available. And if you want to come down to the yellow house on the other side, I can show you the prototype of our Hawken rifle and let you feel what a balanced beauty it is. Uh, there's a lot more to the Hawken shop and a lot more of that kind of stuff that we can talk about personally, but I should have known a long time ago that this was going to come to fruition because I was born in Buffalo, New York. And holy cow, we've got a Buffalo gun built now. And the Lord led me to buy the Gimmer collection, which was the basis of all the parts that came from the Hawkins shop, that I fell into that. And just by luck and by choice, a lot of these things came together. So thank you, Lord. It worked out pretty well. When you are involved with something to a great degree, like building that banger truck that you love above everything, and the woman who's got that little black dress that she loves and so forth. Uh, I had a love affair with the Hawk and Rifle. To such a point that just before I sold my shop and sold my collection, I sold my collection to, back to the Hawk and family. So it's in good keeping as it is now. I sat down and thank God for a little bit of uh, college uh, education in English and so forth, put pen to paper, and wrote my story about a fucking rifle. It tears me up a bit when I even think about it because it was so much a part of my life. And that's what I would like to do now is to Read my poem. It's available. It, it, it lives around here and you can see copies of it. But you just don't get the true meaning of it until you hear Art Russell read it. And I read it because I memorized it. But um, I've got seven years until I'm 100 years old. Consequently, uh, I'm going to read it rather than recite it. So if you don't mind. Name of it is Old Thunder and Me. It's a saga of a honking rifle. It starts out, when once I got my mind on straight and figured where it's at, I kicked the traces of the west with just my coat and hat. I hated Horace Greeley's words because truly they rang best and set my feet ahead towards the gateway to the west. Now when I hit St. Louis town, I didn't spare a cent to outfit with the very best because I was sure hell bent to be the best darn mountain man to ever bear that name. So to the Hawk and Gun Shop, eventually I came. Their rifle's reputation was a legend all its own. A gun so true and sturdy, sure the finest ever known. 
so rugged and so beautiful, the best that they could make was that big boar half stock cat block made for me by Sam and Jake. It took me barely a good week of working every way to learn that rifle in and out. Because sure enough, someday I'd call upon her talent in some moment of true strife, and there'd have to be that knowledge if she was to save my life. I have to mention then some was the measure of her gore, just to face that awesome cavern of children to the core. Her happy voice in times of fun would crack a cheerful sound, but her words of fear and anger would shake the very ground. Now I perceived the friend so true, she surely had a name, a title that would tell the world that she was far from tame. Old Thunder, sure that fit her fine. She'd answer to that call, Old Thunder would do very well, and lightning was the ball. The years were hard, but good to us. I guess we shared God's grace, because many times I nearly saw the old Grim Reaper's face, and more than once we cheated death or evened up the score by some help from the Almighty, our Old Thunder's mighty roar. And now my time for us passed. My eyes are going weak. My voice, once clear and laughing, is just a whisper when I speak. The world no longer knows us, so thunder and a friend. And I fear the times we once knew have come sadly to an end. I don't regret the things I've done, and Lord knows that's a heap. And I ain't one to ask for much, I've always earned my keep. So please, dear God, do grant me. When I hear the angels song, and face the happy hunting grounds, let thunder come along. <laughs> That's touching and it always gets me every time I hear it, three or four times a day. <laughs> <laughs> just, just one other word that um, the Hawk and Shop name uh, have a rifle available down at the range, that Hawken 52 caliber gun. Uh, it's down there for you to shoot. So if you want to go down and take a shot, now it's been restocked. It's not something that's, that's pure. But it started its life as a hawking gun, it's a barrel, it's a trigger group, uh, breaching tank, etc. So if you want to get down the range, uh, take a shot with it, get your little medallion that says, I shot an original, and if you feel like it, make a donation to help us continue this event. So with that, I'm going to hand you over to Bob Woodfield, and I think he has some kind of a modern presentation on this thing behind me, but I'll let him explain it. Bob? Thank you, Greg. Uh, I might mention to you and Arch, you may want to move down front because I'm going to use the screen here behind you. My name is Bob Woodfield. Uh, I feel honored to uh, share this podium with these two gentlemen. They've done very much for the Hawken rifle for the last many years. And uh, I'm just trying to add with it. Uh, just let me hit the uh, computer over here and we'll get started. Sorry about that. 
There we go. Okay, on the left-hand side, I put it in 10-year intervals, 1830 to 40, 50, 60, and 70. The period is pretty well known by Hawking uh, people. This is the pre-1840s. This would be the standard J and S Hawking period. This would be the S Hawking period after Jake died in 1849. And this would be the J.P. Gibbert period, which who bought the Hawking shop in the 60s and carried it through the 70s. The names I've given these cheap pieces, we're going to go back and forth, and you'll see this several times, but I will give you several examples. In the 1830s to 40s, they basically built a rifle with a panel cheap piece. And the examples would be the Christie and the Atchison. The Atchison's on display up at the Sappington house. Uh, Greg Grimes has that up there, and you can go up and see an example of this. The standard G&S Hawken cheek piece, I call it over the wrist. I'm going to give you some examples and show you the geometry here in a minute. Examples for the Medina rifle, the Parkman rifle, and there's one in the Fur Trade Museum. The standard 1850 to 60, which I call the standard S Hawking, is a beaver tail type cheek piece. Examples are Jim Bridger, and Kit Carson, and Liberty and Johnson, which I think you're all familiar with. Well, just a minute, I got one more. To go. Okay, the very last ones were the cheek pieces. I call them the J.P. Gemmer period. Gemmer was one of the craftsmen who bought the Hawkins shop after Hawkins sold it in 1859. They made a variety of cheap pieces ranging from oval to beaver tail. They made them for the cap box, uh, the Gemmer, actually Hawkins, and we have a Hawkins shop Hawkins down there that Greg can show you that exhibits this style of cheap piece. Okay. Thank you. This is an example of the Christie J&S Hawking. This is the one I said would be a typical 1840s. As you can see, it starts up here. It doesn't come clear back into this area, but starts here, comes down, comes up. I'm going to give you a little better picture in a minute. It goes over the wrist. It's paneled. Do you see this little line or shadow line behind, below it? I call that a panel cheek piece. It's believed been made, this gun was made, there's ETC is engraved on the excursion in the cheek piece, and Edmund Christie financed the 1833 rendezvous, and this was given to him as a uh, memento and thanks for financing that rendezvous. Uh, <clears throat> most of this work is done by the uh, Montana Historical Society, and I want to credit them. This gun is currently in the Montana Histor Historical Society in Helena, and you can see it if you go to Helena. But somebody just told me that the museum, they told me that the museum is closed for repairs, the whole, whole museum. So I guess you can't see it right at the moment. Okay, the next one. We should have had the, maybe we skipped one. If we skip one, go back one. Go back one before that. Oh, okay, keep going forward. One more, okay. I guess we didn't have it there. What I want to show you this is an example of the earliest known JMS Hawking. It's called Peterson Hawking. It's in the Cody Museum, and it's believed to be made, and it's probably the first known example of a hawk made in the early 1830s. Jake, I believe, built this rifle. You can see the cheek piece here is very much like a Tennessee, but it does go up and terminates over the top of the wrist. I'll give you some examples of that here in a minute. It's called over the wrist cheek piece termination, and that would be examples of the JNS Hawkins. Okay?
Next one. This is, that's the one I was thinking. This is the Atkinson Hawken, which is on exhibit up at the Sackington House, made for Captain Atkinson in 1836. He was a steamboat entrepreneur, and this was given to him as an honor. This was built at, as the most extensively decorated Hawken known at that time. And uh, it was purchased through the RIA auctions. And this gun is also on display up at the Sabington House. What is important here is, again, you can see well the panel cheek piece that starts here, goes around, continues up, and goes over the wrist, stops at the top, top of the wrist, right between the comb and the wrist. Next one, Molly. This is the Medina JNS Hawken, and this is an excellent example of the JNS cheek piece. Same thing we were talking about, but this one is not tangled. It's not tangled. This starts back here, forms a nice big oval, comes up, and terminates again at the top of the wrist, and right where the comb comes down. And I'm going to give you some close ups of this here in a minute. This particular piece uh, is owned by Jim Gordon in Albuquerque. It has an 1840 stock and an 1850 barrel, and there's quite a bit of controversy about it. But this is an example of a JMS 1840s cheek piece. Next one, thank you. These are a couple close-ups of that one. You can see the, the cheek piece coming up here. It stops right here at the top of the comb. I call that over the wrist, but there's definite ridge there. There's four or five Hawkins of this style that are known, and that would be typical in the 1840s. I just happened to throw the Chief Peaks excursion in on this one. It doesn't have any significance at this stage. <clears throat> the last one that is a JMS, 1840s, over the wrist, is in the Fur Trade Museum in Chadron, Nebraska. Again, it starts high up here, comes around, forms an oval, it's actually an ellipse, comes up and stops at the termination of the comb and the wrist. It's above the wrist and terminates there. This one happens to have an engraved excussion in it, some fancy engravings, and it's shown in Gordon's book. This is Jim Bridger's. S. Hawken rifle. Uh, it's uh, kind of iconic for the Hawken rifle. Everybody, when they think of a Hawken rifle, they think of this one. They don't think of a Thompson Center. But they think of this one. And this is typical of the 1850 to 1860. I call it the standard S. Hawken beaver tail cheek piece. Okay, it forms, starts up here comes around and forms a nice beaver tail, but it terminates halfway between the top of the wrist and the bottom of the wrist, and then dips slightly down. And that cheek piece was copied for 10 years between 1850 and 1860. Uh, the Bridger Hawken is in the Montana Historical Museum, which is closed. <laughs> Next one, Molly. It's another example Good example, the 1850 to 60 Hawken, standard S Hawken, beaver tail cheek piece. This is Kit Carson's Hawken, the last Hawken he owned. Same situation, comes around, forms a nice beaver tail, comes up halfway into the wrist, terminates in the wrist, and has a slight downturn. This one's in the Masonic Lodge in Albuquerque. Okay, the next one. This is Liberty and Johnson's S. Hawken, another 1850 to 60s. It's what we think of when we think of a standard Hawken. But the cheek piece again starts high, forms an oval or a beaver tail portion back here, comes up, terminates one half of the distance between the bottom of the wrist and the top of the wrist, go, terminates right into the wrist before the rock panel, and maybe sometimes has a downturn. <laughs> that particular uh, Hawken is in the Cody Museum, and they are open. <laughs> I 
talked to the curator a couple days ago. Next one, Molly. Oh, thank you. That's good. This is what I call the cat box hawking. This hawking happens to be in the Cody Museum. It's available for viewing. And it's a perfect example of what I call the 1860s to 70s skimmer hawking, which were a variety. But this hawking has an oval. It's actually an oval. It doesn't terminate up here in the wrist or on the top of the wrist. It's oval, like English guns, and it's paneled. They uh, Gimmer made several of those in the 1860s to 1870s, of which this is, this is an example. I call this the cap box hawking, because this is the only hawking I'm aware of that has a true cap box, not a patch box, a cap box. Cap box. And this again would be 60s to 70s. Okay, the next one, Molly. This is copy of an 1860 to 1870 Gimmer beaver tail cheek paste. Again, it's just like the 1850s, comes around in here. And that was copied by Gimmer in the 60s from the 1850 S. Hawkins. Uh, this is an example of that. That is a prototype of the Hawkins shop. And it you see a rifle just like this down at the Hawkins shop today. It's available for purchase. You can purchase kits and make one yourself. They're really quite easy. Just as a quick review, to help in the dating, nothing set. In other words, that could be 1829 or 1831. I'm just using round numbers. That 10-year period, when things were not standardized, the Hawkins shop used a panel type cheek piece, and there are two known examples of that type, of which one of them is up at the second house you can look at. 1840s again is a standard JNS, Jake and Sam Hawkins. That's the one that came up, I call it over the wrist, came up to the top of the wrist. It's the examples of Medina. NC Parkman and the Fur Trade Museum. The Hawken that we normally think of as a standard S Hawken cheek piece. Find my you know, I'm having technical difficulties today. Oh there it is. Huh. It won't shine on there. There's, no, it's a very okay, it doesn't make any difference. 1850s and 60s, that's a standard beaver tail. As I showed you examples of the Bridger, the Kit Carson, and the Liberty and Johnson, uh, that's basically the ones that were carried on for exactly 10 years until Sam Hawkins sold the business and moved to Denver. The last one is the Gammer. There's a variety. I showed you the oval one on the cap box Hawkins, and there's also a standard S Hawkins type cheap piece, of which we have some down at the Hawkins shop we can show you. Okay, let's leave that up there while we answer a few questions. Have I got a couple minutes for questions, Bob or Rick or whoever the manager here? We'll go ahead until somebody yanks us off. Okay, as with many things, I've tried to make it simple. There's always exceptions. There's always other examples, and please make them known to me so I can include them. But we're trying to work out a methodology to date these rifles because Sam and Jake did not put the date of manufacture on them. We have to work back and forth. It's kind of like they use the DNA to catch the uh, criminals today. This is a system that I propose. I'm sure it'll be changed and modified. Probably not perfect, but it's really usable in the form and the, during the work that I used. Okay, questions? Yes, sir. Do you have any idea of the number of No, I don't. Uh, in Hansen's book in 1979, he lists a total of, I think, it's 172 Hawken rifles. He suggests that the workforce in the Hawkins shop of four or five workmen, and either Sam or Jake made 100 Hawkins a year. Well, 
that doesn't calculate out to me. Because I think Hawkins, and I don't believe they can make them that fast. There's no answer to that. Some people think they were everywhere. And you say, well, if they're everywhere, uh, they're that common. Why can't we find them? And they say, oh, they were lost or worn out or they, somebody threw them in the ocean or something like that, which is simple baloney. I don't think there was as many made as people think. There were hundreds made, possibly a few, low few thousand total. Now, don't forget, Hawkins made not only percussion rifles, he also made what we call squirrel rifles, the local Missouri group. And they were flint, uh, not flint, they were percussion, smaller, and sometimes were uh, used brass fittings. And I have no idea how many there are, but there's a lot of gentlemen in this area that collect those, and thousands, okay? Um, I just don't know. And uh, Mr. Hansen tried to go back in the records but there was no distinct manufacturing uh, number given. And he made an estimate of, I think, 172. Now, how many are still in existence? I don't know. Okay, next question. Um, okay, the question is, is what kind of wood was used in the Hawkins stop? Early on, Jake, who was actually the craftsman and built the early rifles, as uh, Greg said, uh, Sam was kind of the civic guy and he ran the fire department. <laughs> the early first ones were made out of American walnut with figure. And I'd say if you see one of those, it'll be in the 1830s. I've not seen any that I would date after 1840 that are made out of walnut. They're made out of maple, either curly maple or straight maple. Generally, they had straight maple with a little curl, but not as curl as we see on the Flintlock Kentucky rifles or some of our makers today. And you know, a guy wants a rifle and he wants all kinds of stripes on it. That's not typical. All you gotta do is look at it. Okay, next question, sir. Did they ever standardize on the foreign cap? Yeah, they did it in a way. And the way they did it was the very first ones were poured. Poured bad. The 1830 ones were poured. I've seen some 1840 ones that were poured. They were all shaped differently. But later on, they bought steel nose caps. And they put them on. It was easier to buy them from an eastern source and put them on than it was to make them. And that is pretty much characteristic of all Hawkins. The earliest Hawkins had the greatest variation, barrels, blocks, wood, whatever you want, because they were individually made and they didn't know what they were doing exactly. They didn't have any, I don't mean to say they didn't know what they were doing, they didn't have anything standardized. But after a while, because, you know, they didn't make these just for people to collect. They made them to sell and make a profit. Uh, the way they did that was to buy parts, including barrels, locks, fittings from the eastern sources, Tyron or some from overseas, uh, Britain or Belgium, and they built them just what we would call it a kit. And that's the way most of those Hawkins were made. And that's your question? Yeah, you know who the maker was back then? We don't. There's no no name can be attached to any one Hawken rifle, such as Jake or Sam, and they were in partnership. Although I can see by studying them what I call Jake's hand. And Jake tended to make the earliest ones in the 1830s. And then later on, maybe they were made by a craftsman and just finished by Sam. So they didn't stamp any names, they didn't stamp any dates, they didn't stamp any calibers or anything like that. So we don't know. It's only subjective. Right. So there's no records no. show purchasing. No, nothing in the records. Now, Mr. Hansen's gone through all the records and the show accounts and everything. Yeah. 
not there. We're starting. Okay. Yes, sir. Did any of those white girls have progressive right wing twist? None that I know of. The guys who should ask that question to her are gone. Say it again, I didn't. Oh. I'm sure they didn't make bullet molds after the first couple of them, but I'm sure they made them available and they shipped bullet molds with rifles to the outdoor post, such as Fort Bent in Colorado and Fort Laramie in Wyoming. And back in those days, it was common when you bought a new muzzle of rifle, you got a bullet mold with it for that one. And of course, they got lost and misplaced and all that stuff through the years. Okay, yes, sir. The And uh, all this information is in that book. 
So if you read the book or read Love and Blast, you should have it all. Now, the book sold out. The NMLRA sold it for me, and they sold out. And hopefully, if I live long enough, we'll produce an updated version of that. It won't be just a straight copy. But, oh, okay. This is the book, The Hawking Rifles. 1822 to 1870. Uh, I made several mistakes in here, but I did state it at the beginning that that's the scientific process. You report on what you think, you report the data, you know it's going to change, and as people give me input and change it, or they want to write an article, that's great. So we'll make it even better. But there are some mistakes in here, and I hope to correct those with an updated version in a couple of years, hopefully. <laughs> okay, is it hot out there? <laughs> oh, the ice cream truck is coming by. <laughs> okay, oh, thank you, Molly. This is Molly. She had helped me show my slides. <laughs> I need a break. <laughs> uh, where are the uh, they're up next right there. We have, he, he's right a few minutes late. Oh, he's the restaurant. Okay. Yeah, he's right. oh, uh, is that okay, Bob? Or I think I'm done.